Imagine learning indigenous language from an AI, from a friendly avatar, or an immersive dreamscape. Imagine flying through landscapes created of Iroquois symbols or examining digital regalia in virtual space. And imagine gathering with friends and family in these created environments to practice speaking in your native language. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. And I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by Monigar, the founder of Monigar.com, a small tech company based in the Akwesasne Indian Reservation. Monigar develops XR, aka Extended Reality, solutions and custom software with a focus on indigenous language revival, futurism, and culture. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you here and talk about your work. Can we start by sort of unpacking what is XR? What are extended reality environments? Sure. So in my world, XR, it's a term we use for a lot of different things. So augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, 360 film, 180 film, even spatial audio. So it's extended reality on top of the real world. So when you mean on top of the real world, again, just if you could sort of draw a picture for a listener that might not have any idea, I mean, is it sort of like Pokemon Go kind of thing where you might have artificial digital objects and characters overlaid on real-time video of the real world? So in my world, I see as extending the physical world with whatever I have to work with. So it might be like last year, I had these Bose augmented reality sunglasses. And in that, there's only audio. So when you're walking to certain GPS points, you can hear my language being spoken. And I'm actually directing you, look at this rock where there was like a beautiful picture on it. And it tells you a little story about it. So I'm just laying over the real physical world, just extended things. That might be audio, it might be visuals, even things that don't exist yet, like maybe smells right now. It's extending the real physical world. So this is your job. This is what you do. You got this job, how? How does someone become an XR artisan? I don't know if that's the word or... My husband last night was describing my work. He said, I'm a dream stylist because I'm like bringing people into like some of my dreams and my imagination. Like I can actually put you into like how I see the world with virtual reality, which is very much like going into some of my dreams. How I got into it, I definitely have had a life experience that's not mainstream. So I left home when I was really young. In the 70s, I was raised in an Indian reservation with my grandparents. Awesome people. They just treated me so well, like a human being. But then I was forcefully removed to go live with a family that's not Native. So I lived from the time I was maybe five or six years old with this family, and I was kept isolated. It was very abusive and violent until I was about 13 or 14 years old. So I decided as a young child to just leave. My first attempt, I lived in the forest overnight, you know, because I was just a kid. I'm trying to figure out how do I escape this violence, you know, without hurting anyone or myself. So I stayed in the forest because I've always loved the forest. That didn't work out too well. My second attempt, I did make it to a city. And that's a whole other story. So how I got into this job that I'm in now is that I have had this life experience where I'm not led by fear. Of course, I feel fear, you know, and I'm scared of things especially violent genocidal colonization is the best way to describe it. But I don't allow that to lead my work. I don't allow it to lead my relationships with people. And so I do things that are really considered not too normal or even neurodivergent. So I made my job, really. This could be like a whole program all in its own. But given that background, at some point, you must have been in front of a video game or something where all the light bulbs went off. And I'm just curious what that looked like. So in the mid 70s, I was always around war veterans, male war veterans. So the male war veterans have a huge impact and influence on my life and how I see the world. They were communication specialists and even in the front lines of war. So the non-native family I want to go live with, they had a Tandy TRS-80 in the house and told me, don't touch it. Yeah, right? From Radio Shack. And like no one else had those. So I didn't have anyone to talk with and I'm like isolated. So no one's around, which was often. 
I would sneak in there because I was just learning how to read and I would follow the instructions in the book and I started programming Eliza right out of the book. The neat thing for me was, and it's really a huge impact on my work, is having these people that really had a lot of hate for me, not knowing that I'm building that, I would sneak around. I'd even be hiding up by the ceiling and watching these people that hated my guts having fun playing the software program I just made. Like they were laughing and smiling and giggling, like a grown man giggling that I usually only seem angry, you know? Even today, I get really excited when I can build these solutions on machines that are respectful and communicate and show how I see the world in ways that people can benefit and be happy and respected. Like that's just amazing to me. I just think it's amazing that you built an AI as a kid in the 70s on a Tandy, but you built your AI chatbot in the 90s, right? What was the motivation for building that? Remember, I left home when I was 13 or 14 and life was really hard. I was a homeless teenager. So I would go into libraries, public libraries, because it was a little safer there. And sometimes they'd even have computers that I could mess with. And I went literally overnight from being a homeless street urchin to having a job in tech. Like, huge life change. Like, being below poverty for all my life to getting this six-figure job overnight. Because I did the interview, and Carrier Corporation was my first big one. They hired me. Man, that was exciting. And back then, they didn't have these language translators and speech engines and things like that that we have today. So that's what I helped Carrier Corporation to do. Asian speakers could communicate and collaborate on the same project with English speakers. So that's like what a chatbot is, is that where you can type in phrases and it translates for you? Yeah. The crossover that you do of language and software and imagination is just a really interesting place. It's not something that gets taught at school, you know. So I'm curious about the journey that brought you to where you are. Yeah, so Carrier, that is part of the journey. And it does go back to my grandparents when I was young. They were so below poverty, like we didn't even have running water, like we had an outhouse. Then to go live with this non-Native family who had excessive money and resources. So I've been in these really stark contrasting worlds, but at my grandparents, I still remember the conversation with my grandmother teaching me about respect, about even these machines. Like there are beings in all of these machines. And when we don't respect them or we're using them to do disrespectful things, that's what we output to the world. So I went from homeless to working in the corporate world. I was definitely a workaholic. So I was working nonstop to the point of burnout. I was doing it to myself, but I was extremely lonely and I was becoming disconnected to my grandparents, disconnected to everything that makes me a human being. Because I was just like, wow, let's make all this money and I'm in the tech world and oh my God, I can buy my own car, you know, all these things that I didn't have before. And so the jump over to building bots, the best way I can describe it is I was feeling like desperately lonely and scared because to be in the world as a young woman in an industry that's known for being very toxic towards women and very dangerous. So one day I said, you know what? I think what it is, I miss speaking in my language that I grew up with as a child. Like I'm losing my identity and becoming this overworked robot. So I just started building these bots that speak my own language for myself. It was selfish. That's what started it. I build physical robots and um Nice. So back in the day, I was given a t-shirt that said, I tried to make new friends, but I ran out of parts. <laughs> right. <laughs> and given that you were talking about being almost like a dream stylist, I could totally see that. I think it often starts there. You start creating these environments that you want to be in. So since a lot of your work is about language revival and retention, and for the listeners, what I've seen is some of these videos where you have these kind of digital humans that are speaking your native language, and I guess maybe sometimes even teaching the language, this became important for you as an issue of identity. So you brought these tools that you already had on hand to bear, but this is your language. This is like a language you grew up speaking. I mean, in that sense, you are a native speaker. I'm asking because when I first looked at your projects, I was really curious because I know that having people that are continuing to speak some of these languages is getting to be a problem. Yes, I'm a speaker. And even if I think I know what I'm doing, I have a group of people I check in with fluent speakers from Ghanawage, Six Nations, all over the place. Because I don't say I'm fluent, 
I always need someone that's not in my little bubble because there's some things that we're not supposed to share with the public. And sometimes I get so excited that, you know, they keep me in check. They're like, don't put that in the public, not right now. And this is why. When I was looking at your work and I was actually talking about this with a friend of mine, I felt that there were really some profound questions that come up as a result of this work. And one was, if you're using these digital creatures to sort of preserve the language, I was thinking, I hope they're getting it right. Because <laughs> it would be kind yeah. of ironic because that digital creature could live a lot longer than any of us. So my friend says, well, can I go look at this stuff? And I said, I don't know how much of this would really be available anyway. His point was, can a non-native speaker go and learn the language using these digital creature tools? And I said, I'm going to have to ask. I don't know. And he said, why? I said, well, it's not necessarily a tool for me to learn the language. Then he said, well, but if the language has fewer speakers or not very many speakers, is there something to be said for getting anybody speaking the language? And I said, I don't know. I'll ask her. Welcome to my world. This is an everyday conversation. My big challenge is how to respond to them in a way that's respectful because it can be triggering. But first off, anyone can learn to speak the language. It doesn't turn you into a Nguahunwe or Gonyagehaga person. So anyone can learn to speak the language, of course. But there's a lot of things and protocols going on where we hold each other accountable. Like for me, I have people that hold me accountable and they will publicly shame me if they need to. And that's what I'm talking about. You learn to not be led by fear. So you learn, you know, your place. I think one of the most important things, if you're non unglahunwe or non-native learning these languages, you always, always, always remember, you are not going to be a representative or a speaker for these people. As long as you remember that, you're going to be fine. And then you can communicate with the people. And even me, like I come from, and a lot of my friends too, we come from both, say, Unguahunwe people and also genocider. Like it's in our DNA. And I think the worst thing that a person can do is not acknowledge that because then they're not going to learn those things like letting go of ego and remembering not to speak for your whole community because you can't. Because I will never experience life with racism because of the color of my skin. Because I look very pale. I don't experience that kind of racism. I never will. So as long as you remember that, I think everything's fine. Do you call them AIs? What do you call your digital human speaking creations? So I pushed back right up until last year. Like I was like, I will never make them look like human beings. Because I just, that's so, <laughs> like none of my AIs, I come artificial intelligence, none of them have the goal of becoming human or any of that. Like there's no shame in being a software program. There's no shame in being an AI. There really isn't. It is what it is, you know? There's no shame of being a cartoon or a computer. You know, that's just how I was raised. The rock over there, the tree, it's not a shame to be a rock or a tree. That's how I look at it. You are programming and teaching them to a certain degree to speak your native indigenous language. Banyageha. So anybody can go and sort of interact with these AIs to make their best attempt at learning the language. Your AIs are mostly straight language stuff. You're not dealing with what I would call the cultural stuff. Yeah, and to be entertained. It's for entertainment. I mean, it's coming from my crazy imagination. And the language has already been preserved by a lot of people that lived way before me. So for me, it's like I'm building something with what they've already done. They preserve the language and the dialects. And as far as culture goes, like our ceremonies, things like that, I won't put it in there. This is me. I'm sharing how I see the world. This seems like the right place. Before we close out this segment, I noticed that your AI language speakers, or at least the ones that I saw, had elf ears. <laughs> I had to really think about some of the influences. I love that movie Pan's Labyrinth with the fawn. And whenever I build anything, it's to be reused and 360 films and all kinds of stuff. And so the one that you definitely saw is called Wani Galago, which is Monica of the Forest. And I have this whole story that's being worked on now. It's like she's in the forest. You don't know what time era she's from. And I just love that idea. Of, like maybe she's mixed like I am and maybe she's mixed with a fawn. I don't know. I'm still working on it. Why does she have to have ears that we expect anyway? You know, maybe she has a tail too. We don't know if she has a tail yet. To be honest, I expected to see an AI that looked like someone from the community. It was not that at all. And that actually made it much more interesting. You know what, though, is she does look a little bit like some of the people here. They're like, 
were you looking at my picture? And I'm like, yeah. you know what? You probably are stuck in my mind a bit. The shape of your face and yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for joining us today. A little earlier, we were talking about how you got into some of your language revival work because you were seeking connections with yourself and your community and your family. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've ended up making so many connections with native speakers and the people who are holding you accountable and other people who want to be learning your language? It's konya keha. Konya keha. Yeah. God. I'm working on You're it. Close. I'm working on it. It's very close. I know. I need to pony up the subscription, right? <laughs> So it's a wild story. So in the 90s, this kind of work wasn't well known. So I wanted to learn and remember how to speak again because I hadn't been speaking with anyone for, gosh, probably since I was like six years old till I was like in the 90s, I was just hitting my 20s. So I built what I wanted to know in this AI bot. And then, you know, you could just look up the words and dictionaries. And then back then, you know, I'd go to the library and just seek out like where are these dictionaries and things like that so i typed so much information i ended up getting gangliatic cysts in both my hands it was insane because we didn't have you know apis and stuff for this so i built that out then what i did is nobody knew i was doing this you know because i'm alone i'm a workaholic whatever so then i started i was like i got an idea because i could do web scrapers and bots and all this stuff i just unleashed it to the internet and i would let anybody talk with it and I would use that information to say, you know what? I was like, I see this trend here in this geographical location. This is what everybody likes to talk about. So then I'd find the information for my language and figure out how to communicate and put that into my knowledge base for my bot. Well, then it started getting attention. So I was invited to compete. There was about 80 of us all over the world. We all put in our bots in there to compete and it was mostly all white guys. And they said, no, we don't want your stuff in here. It's only for English. And a really cool thing happened. And I know it's because of the way I was raised. I debated them. And at that time, I was in the 90s, coming from Hola's background. I'm not in academia. And these are all PhDs, NASA engineers. And I told them, I was like, that's so not cool that you're telling me that only English is the only intelligence in the world. Smarten up. So they let me in, I competed, and the bot actually got a bronze medal. And I was like, holy crap, I actually got a bronze medal for like the most knowledgeable bot. These guys that were like really intimidating to a lot of people, they actually were really cool for me to talk with because they were educating me about their side of the world and their stuff and like why they see things the way they were. And they were saying, well, how did you make this so that it's so intuitive to speak with people? And back then, I didn't know how to answer them, you know, because I was just a kid myself. I was young. Um, but now looking back, I think it's because of the way I was raised is so different than, say, the non-native part of my family tree. It's very different the way we're raised and the way we see the world. And that is hard to explain in English when you're doing bots and stuff and how they communicate. But you can see the results when you talk with them. Were you able to make connections within the Akwesasne community with other native language speakers? When I got the bronze medal, I got a lot of attention all over the internet and these really big, huge tech corporations were contacting my bots 
and my bots were eating up all that information. And then I started getting publicity. And of course, media picked it up and said stuff like end of the world, Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of PR, right, right, which I right. really wasn't a fan of. It's the indigenous Terminator. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Something about they've risen. And of course, it caught the attention of people in my community, my reservation where I grew up. And they were really ticked off. They were mad. Like, what the hell are you doing? Who are you? Who gave you permission to do that right away? You know, so we all have these stories following our roots back to our family tree. People are like, who the hell are you? What are you doing? You know, where have you been? Because I was gone for about 10 years. So people started learning what I was doing. They pushed back hard and they were angry about some of the things. And of course, me being young, I didn't understand. Through all that turmoil and those challenges, that's when I started learning, well, why are they mad? You know, things like that. And then I became more aware of, oh my God, I'm experiencing life looking like a person with pale skin. I don't face those same racism, you know, because I wasn't even aware of that as a kid. Even in my 20s, I just wasn't aware. I think maybe non-natives think it's cruel, but really it's how we hold each other accountable and to be decent human beings. Because for me, I don't know for sure if it's neurodivergent, but there's things I don't pick up on unless someone like points it out in a blunt way to me. And my community, like the elders especially, like they know my family, they remember me when I was a child. So they know my traits and they know how to deal with me and point things out that maybe people that aren't from my community wouldn't know. I'm in my 50s now, so I've had from the 90s till now where people in my community know all about my work. They know all kinds of stuff that the general public doesn't know about why I do things, how I do things, stuff like that. It seems like some of your work has been opening up spaces for people to join in virtual spaces to talk with each other or to contribute their own pronunciations or idioms to your giant bot. <laughs> yeah. So my grandfather, he survived the mush hole, the residential school. And one of the things that I found with my work is that I speak a certain way. Like I can't roll the R sound the way my friends and relatives roll the R sound, like Ganawage. So we have people that speak differently. We even have people when I was a kid, I call it frog town accent. We're all speaking the same language, but we have different little things that we do, like potato, potato. So what I do is not tell people they're speaking right or wrong, that here's what we have to work with. We're going to do the best we can. If the goal of some of your projects is to sort of get the language out there, even if you're going to give some leeway for pronunciations, but isn't there a point where it's just so far outside what would be regular or perfect pronunciation that it's not understandable? Absolutely. I um, just recently found out there's a whole family that have introduced a new letter into our alphabet and they pronounce it. So we've been violently colonized. And then who am I to come in and say, you're not speaking right, blah, blah. They're doing the best they can. And when you're connected with your people and your community, you find out, oh, that's why they're speaking that way. To me, it is a fine line. And the part where, say, the general public doesn't realize that actually does upset me is the tech part. We have one ISO code for all of our dialects. And English speakers call it Mohawk language, by the way. So all the work I do, it gets squished into one ISO code, which we want to talk about really causing chaos for future generations, because we have a Central Eastern and Western dialect, plus all the family dialects. All getting squished into one ISO code. That to me is awful. For the listener who may not understand, what do you mean by an ISO code for the language? I do things where even in the 90s, I would look at a machine and I would say, what speech engine is already installed by default? And it's usually English in America. So I can force an English speech engine to pronounce my language. My dream was, oh, we'll have a speech engine for, say, Eastern, Central, and Western Mohawk language, which would be ideal. And by a speech engine, you mean like a text reader? Yeah, it'll take the text that you put in and it will read it out loud with audio properly. And the ISO code is what is sort of in there to tell the reader what language to plug in. Yeah. And so you're saying there's one ISO code for all the dialects. Well, like when you go into your Microsoft language settings, you can choose Mexican Spanish or Spanish Spanish or whatever. Yeah. 
So for me, like as the nerd, that's the kind of thing that really gets me all worked up and upset. <laughs> right, right, right. Whereas other people, like they're not building the tech, they're like, oh, well, that's not the correct way to say a greeting, say a go. Another one will say, say go. You know what I mean? And they all get in these fights over it, which is valid fights because you don't want to, like you said earlier, you don't want to be pushing forward wrong pronunciations that's going to totally mess up revival of the language. What's more important, correcting people to speak the way I speak or saying, you know what, let's do the best we can with what we have to work with because baby steps will all get there eventually. Listening to you talk about the trauma associated with speaking your native language that has echoed through generations, your language learning environments are very whimsical and beautiful and sparkly and fun. Is there a way that some of that gamification and that dreamscape setting sort of helps take back some of the joy in speaking the language? Yeah, because I think the core reason why I wanted to reconnect with the language in the first place is because growing up my whole life, all my best, most joyful memories are with the language and the culture. So no amount of colonization or violence can take those memories away from me. So I like to share that part of it when I can because it heals and it helps me continue, you know, especially during the pandemic making these environments so that it is all joyful and happy and like this positive, beautiful experience. I'm finding it does help people that aren't even native. Just before the pandemic, I watch people when they go into my experiences. So far, I've seen everyone like get really happy about it. Like they feel good when they're in there. How would you see them going through your environments? So with VR, um, especially with the language stuff, I created all these different experiences where I would invite people to events and I've even been at Ottawa summer solstice, 80,000 people there. And I would set up the whole thing for them. And I even had what I call VR flight attendants so that they would sanitize everything after every person. Cause I'm a germaphobe too. I like little details like that really bother me. And when these people go in there, especially the older people, I watch their face and their body language. And then when they're coming out, I introduce myself. I'm like, what'd you think? And stuff like that. And they tell me, they tell me exactly what they think, but you can't help but notice a person, especially a grown adult when their jaws dropped on the ground and they're giggling and stuff like that with this VR thing on their face, you can't help but notice. So has it been harder during the pandemic to get that kind of feedback? I'm not getting any feedback during the pandemic. And obviously no events where you get to debut the cool stuff to people. No, not right now. I guess I wanted to ask a little bit about some of the cultural elements that you bring in sort of artistically. I mean, there's elements in the dress for your digital humans. There's elements in the environment. A lot of it is very nature-based. Where does all that inspiration come from? So my whole life, I've always been surrounded by forests. The Aquasasne, our reservation, this part of it is an island surrounded by the St. Lawrence River. I hike mountains, and that's just what I do. I've always been that way. And this is sort of the difference between having the background that you've had and, you know, not having the years of academe, like, fetter your imagination and be like, oh, well, you have to learn language in a classroom. Like, no, I want to learn language flying around and finding colorful bubbles, right? <laughs> <laughs> what inspired you to sort of add those gamification elements? So everything I build, I'm not building it really to entertain, say, non-natives. All these spaces where we accommodate English and French and Spanish. I even know how to say things in Russian. We do a really good job of that. But where do I go to just be who I am without having to explain myself? And so that's what I build. And when I build that, I think what is good for non-natives to know is I can do that without thinking about entertaining or teaching a non-native. I could build a whole environment like that. And you can go in there and you're still going to be safe. You know that you're respected and you can actually enjoy the space. 
And that's how I approach it. I'm building these spaces for myself, obviously. I'm kind of selfish with that, but also for other people that speak my language because we go in these spaces. Nobody has to explain, oh, there's the seven dancers in the sky. Like, we just look up and we know the whole story, the creation story behind that or behind the sky domes. Like we just know these things, but we don't see it out in the world. We don't see it in media or films or anything. So that's just how I build these spaces, like how I see the world. That's just remarkable. Really cool stuff. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm curious about the professional side of the community that you've been building. Do you work with languages other than your own, or are there other language revivalists that you're working with? Yeah, and it depends on the project because a lot of these languages, the endangered languages, they are documented. And for a while, I created bots for them and everything, but it goes back to connecting with my community and they taught me like that is not my place to be doing that. So I absolutely stopped and I would never put that work out to the public. It's just not my place to be working on someone else's language. That said, though, like I have other communities that will reach out to me and they ask me to help. And in that situation, what I've been doing is, especially now with everyone's used to working online, I've been doing online training and I show them like, this is how I'm doing things with my language. And this is how your team with your language and culture can do it. And I do like a four day workshop, half day or full day workshops where I just let them know all the challenges, the pitfalls, things that worked for me, and then they can make a choice how they want to proceed with their own language revival. The people that you're working with, are you seeing more concern among tribal members for making sure that those programs and those tools are coming from them? Are tribes becoming more aware of, you know, it's time for them to stake their claims? Yes, and actually there's entire groups on the internet that will hold those people accountable. If they're doing cultural appropriation or trying to speak for people that they have no business doing, they are held accountable and publicly shamed, as they should be. Even for me too, I get called out and questioned by people that haven't grown up with me or know my family, and that's totally normal. In fact, I'm so used to it now, and it's understandable. One thing that I've seen a lot, and I still see in the tech industry especially, is I'll have non-natives, they don't know me, they didn't grow up with me, without even asking me, they make these assumptions about me in the tech industry, and then they go on a spiel about wanting to save all my people and my community because they have the tech skills, because I certainly couldn't have those tech skills, you know, these assumptions that they have. So we do get that a lot, and it's not just here in my community, it's all the communities. We're calling it saviorism. They assume that we don't have tech skills or interest or knowledge, and um, that's not true at all. And it's real simple as nothing about us without us. Like I would never go to say Craig's house and say, you know what? I found this recording of your grandfather and now I speak for and represent your grandfather. People that do that and are exploitive, they just put themselves in a circle that they're gonna have to deal with. I think one of the cool lessons I learned in life is like, it's not for me to carry because early in my career, I also fell into that where I was like, oh, I'm gonna make it so we can all speak my language and it'll never be lost. And it was also fueled by the rage of the residential school trickle effect. And so it took a whole community of Akwesasne, really, whether they know it or not, some of them, 
to help me heal from that and learn better ways and get me out of that vicious circle. The whole point of speaking our language and communicating it is to be connected with our family and with our homelands too, our Mother Earth that does connect us. It's not about saving or being a hero. Is anyone else creating this kind of material with you? It seems like you're sort of a solitary creator. You don't have a staff. Yeah, sometimes I do. Who's helping you do this kind of work? So there's a few older people in my community. They are my advisors, my mentors, they're fluent speakers. They keep me in check. <laughs> um, they tell me if pronunciations are off. They help me um, improve my pronunciation. They actually have not wanted their voice on my stuff because the kind of work I do, you're kind of the front person. So you take all the punches, you take all the anger and all the miscommunications. So they're older people. They've been working with me and I do pay them as consultants. And then there's other speakers from other communities. I pay them to actually teach me. We meet online twice a week and I go through language and culture classes with them. And then they also mentor me and advise me when I have questions. Like I'm learning how to deal with angry people on the internet in a nicer way because my history has been like a temper like I have a temper and I swear you know so I'm learning a better more appropriate way to navigate that so yeah those are the people and I also hire remote contractors to help me with tech sometimes that's what I was curious about is on the tech side too yeah so i've hired 3d graphic designers and sometimes they do get frustrated with some of the weird requests i had and they said you know you should really learn this because you're coming up with these <laughs> weird ideas i don't know how to do this so that's when i started learning 3d graphic design too but i still hire graphic designers to work with me like on texturing or modeling you know whatever i need really even music composers but they may be outside the community yeah, and they're all Oklahoma, all over. Most of them are from North America, though, Canada and USA. I wanted to go back to something that you said about your elders who consult with you on uh, native language use and pronunciation and so on and so forth. When I went to your site, I guess I'm thinking mostly of mohawklanguage.ca. You have a statement there in a few places that says, we're not providing English translations. If you want to know what these words are about, you too can hire a native language speaker as a consultant. And I thought this is something that creative professionals are trying to shift into of saying my work has value, my knowledge has value. And I think that's a really interesting, positive shift to see knowledge of this language has value and you should be acknowledging that value if you want to know. Yeah. Do you see other people also sort of helping to shift that paradigm of people wanting to come in and extract information without any acknowledgement of its value? Oh, I'm so glad you noticed that because I've been working really hard since September, consciously working hard to create that where people know, like, I am not a teacher. I'm not teaching. And that you need to work with teachers and fluent speakers and elders because I'm a nerd. I build software. I'm not a brain scientist. I'm not an astronaut. I build software. And I build this software because we have fluent speakers and teachers and elders from every background you can imagine that consult with me. And I pay them a fair compensation for their time. And then I also make sure that they know what am I doing with this and why am I doing it so that it's not presented in a disrespectful way. Given again that you're talking about checking in with the really fluent speakers, your AIs that are speaking the language, is that digitally synthesized or is that recorded speakers? It's both. Now, the ones that you probably saw, though, on Vimeo and on Mohawk Language, that's my voice. That's actually my voice. And I change it sometimes because I have different fluent speakers of different ages that work with me. As some of them don't even hear very well. So I even change my voice to be more like them. So sometimes I'm talking really low, sometimes high, you know. But there's also digitally synthesized. I mean, do you have that kind of text reading working at this point for the language? Yeah, and that's what I did in the 90s, but I don't have it for the public right now because I found a lot of the older people, the fluent speakers, found it really disturbing. So I'm waiting on that. And I understand why now. It's because if you're being heavily colonized and genocided, would you really like the idea of this robotic voice 
replacing you even as a teacher because that's what people do they try to use that as a replacement to a uh, human connection so it's not public the text reader voice wasn't going over with the community no not at all and i loved it personally because i was like because <laughs> i'd have this same word over and over and then i'd go to my grandfather and i would say the word and he wouldn't even correct me or anything so i was like oh this is working i'm actually learning how to speak better but yeah <laughs> We did a show a while back that was about assisted technologies, and it would seem that what you would program would be something that could be useful if someone in your community has vision problems and wants to be online and have a web page read in their language, but you feel like it's not quite ready for prime time in that way? or I think it's ready for techies, but right now, my community in particular, we're still facing really violent colonization where when I leave my house, we have border guards that we have to answer to when I leave or return from my home here. If I dare speak my language, I get threatened, harassed, even pulled into a back room. So we're navigating that. And to have a computerized voice speak our language and then to have non-natives say, hey, look at this teaches a language. That's way too triggering. We're not in a place where we can even support something like that. Like we have to focus on supporting human beings right now. This is definitely off topic from the project itself, but I can't help but ask, why are things so hardcore at the reservation up there? So different people call it different things. I call it a reservation or a POW camp myself. Um, so we have the borders of New York State, USA, Quebec and Ontario, Canada, it's right on top of our reservation. So the section where I live at, to leave a return from our house, and it's the only way to go. If I take a right down the road, we have the CBSA, who are very violent. They can be really violent, so it's like a roulette game. I don't know if they're having a bad day or whatever. The CBSA is what? Canadian Border Service Agency. They're providing a service. If I take a left, I've got the U.S. border providing their service. And again, it's like a roulette game. If they're having a bad day, I have to pay for it. A lot of us do. And if I want to guarantee a bad day, I'll speak my language when they ask me. For real. How would you feel if they addressed you in your language? They do it sometimes, and it's pretty nasty because I've had one where he learned our language, and he says, Sego, skenagoa. And that means, hello, like, are you at great peace? You know, are you feeling peaceful? That's another thing, because I think when I was a child, hearing my family, they're really good storytellers, and they love to make people laugh and forget about the pain. So as a child, I would try to emulate that. And part of those storytelling is you'll put that person in the story and exaggerate so people are laughing. And I remember as a child trying to emulate that, my grandfather goes, whatever you do, don't ever lie. So I remember that to this day. So when I speak English and I leave my house, I always have to lie to these people because if I say the truth in my language, like the question is, where are you coming from? I'm coming from Gawanoge Goa. I can't say that. I have to lie and say, I'm coming from Ontario, which is a lie to me. The choices of how we think about these things, I think, are deeply rooted in language. It's like what it's all about. Oh, so when he says, Sego, skena, goa, are you at peace? I truthfully said, Yo, skena, which means, no, I'm not really feeling that peaceful. It's not the end of the world. I don't feel really peaceful right when I go through here. He corrected me. So he learns our language, a few things, and then decides that he's going to be my teacher and correct me and tell me that I need to answer that, yes, I'm peaceful. I'm like, no, you don't do that to human beings. Try to, you know, control our voice. Like if you ask someone how they're doing, I mean, a lot yeah. of people just go, fine, thanks. But some people like me go, oh, you really want to hear the story? They're like, no, shit. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Sorry, I asked. It's almost the equivalent of telling you you should smile more, except with that extra layer of here I am, the authoritarian figure that yeah. can keep you from leaving this island. And you should smile more. Yeah, it's like constant colonization. You want to hear about my day? Like, <laughs> well, if you're going to speak our language, you need to learn how to speak our language. <laughs> you're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us today. I wanted to loop back around to the extended reality. You work on so many different platforms. So how did you get into doing XR work? And what is the evolution of what kind of platforms you've been using and what you've been using them for? Really, it comes down to making a solution with what I have to work with. Because the core of what I do is to revive my language. So in the beginning, it was just for me, and I had access to things that the general public didn't, so it was pretty wild. Like we even had it where those AI bots were text-to-speech. Those were actually put into remote control robots that we would roll down the street. It was insane. But like that's not really appropriate for the general public. So now, as it's evolved, I have a big focus on what is actually accessible to the people that want to use this, that enjoy it, and also what is reusable to like all these techies that are unkwahume that want to build their own solutions. So I have a GitHub repository right now where we're just building that up and starting to talk with a lot of new people about how can they reuse all the stuff that I built for their own projects, even their own languages that are different than mine. And does that include environments and the AIs themselves and textures and whatnot so they can get up and running a lot quicker if they wanted to? Yep. And including, I call AI ML. So artificial intelligence markup language is really old. It's like the smoke and mirrors of AI, but I want to make that so it's reusable by Ongwahume teams for their own language and culture. When it comes to some of the environments and AIs that you've created, what I saw was a Vimeo sort of introduction to what you're doing. But practically speaking, does someone need to have special software on their phone or laptop? Or have an Oculus? Yeah, so the stuff right now for the general public, you just need a connection to the internet and either phone or a tablet or a laptop, and you can access it that way to hear the language. It's just animations and film. Then I have other stuff for people that are into virtual reality. So there's things in the Oculus store and there's things in the Steam VR store. There's even stuff on itch.io. And then the other stuff that's really technical, that really is for engineers that I'm talking with and they're Ungwahunwe, the goal is that will be available. So that's more accessing the code. And I'm looking at, you know, making it so that it's an API available to people, like software as a service. That's really what I'm looking at so that people can reuse it. But on the virtual reality side, if they get this from the Oculus store, then it's presumed that whatever viewing software they need, it's pretty standard in that way. Yeah, because Oculus and Steam, they have a whole thing they do. They test all your stuff. If it's not working right for an end user that's not technical, they won't allow you in the stores. I'm really curious. On this kind of work, how are you making a living at this? So last year, I was accepted for my very first grant. So I got a grant from Canada Council, and it's covered me from last September until May of this year for this mohawklanguage.ca. All of that stuff I'm doing right now is covered by a grant. And that pays for all the people that I hire and the production and some of the software, whatever I need to make this happen. But typically, I do what any tech person does. I do my tech interviews, I get hired, and I don't have a social life. I just use my money to build these things. <laughs> so for a while, you were doing your regular commercial work, and that's how you pay your bills. But now it sounds like you're trying to take it to the next level and get funding for it directly. Yeah, but I want to mention, though, he doesn't like to be acknowledged. He's really shy. I met my husband about 18 years ago, and honestly, there have been times where, like, say, if I couldn't get a job or whatever, he made sure everything was taken care of. He made sure I was taken care of, and all these projects are paid for. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, uh, creative and tech professionals, you're often trying to do work that you find interesting and meaningful, and some of it you're trying to get paid for. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm always looking at like, how am I going to make this so that people can benefit from it? Because otherwise, that'd be kind of silly if I'm just making it only for me, and then it dies with me. That'd be kind of silly, I think. But if that's what's meant to be, it will happen too. So you've got some stuff that you're letting loose to engineers who might want to reuse some of the things that you've created. 
Are you putting any binders on them in terms of what they can and can't do with this? In our earlier discussions, it seems like you have a very, very clear sense of the ways in which you don't necessarily want this effort and technology to be used. But do you have concerns that others might not take the same approach? You know, are there license agreements? That's sort of what I'm asking also. Are there privacy considerations, permissions considerations, given that some of the stuff is recorded speakers and whatnot? Does that kind of make sense? Totally makes sense. So in the 90s, things that I was approached with to me in the tech industry, I will just say gross and vulgar sometimes, okay? So I was very aware of situations. So one of the first things I did with my AI bots is I developed the Monogar Guardian of AI Code of Ethics. Because I used to get hired by the tech industry to write up all these corporate policies. So I did that for the AI and I put everything you can imagine in there, like every nightmare. And like, this is how we got to deal with it. Say if a person's a fluent speaker and they didn't grow up with tech, they have no idea. Like unless someone talks with them about this is what happens in the tech industry literally what has happened in the tech industry and this is what i did to protect us correct the situation what's that video game that came out there and they can't stop people from being very disrespectful with keanu reeves character like that's a well-known issue since at least the 90s you know what i mean like a lot of people they don't think about these things in the big picture when you're sharing the back-end technology or the models or the work, whatever it is that you might want to share, you actually go over what you consider the ethical considerations of how this stuff should be used. Yeah, absolutely. There's other things too. It gets pretty messy, but I do the really uncomfortable conversations with local people about laws. Like, do you want it to be under our traditional laws? the great law of peace. Do you want it to be under English laws? Do you want it to be under Canadian laws? What would you like to do in this situation? Because I need to know who I'm working with. For me personally, I've learned the very hard, painful way that with this kind of work, if someone chooses to appropriate or abuse or disrespect, that is definitely not mine to carry. I'll do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen, but it's not mine to carry. So I don't go and play identity police or anything like that because when you look at the natural world and natural law, which I'm a fan of, that's when you see those people being held accountable by the public. Like if you're doing something dirty to Ungwahumwe people, you're gonna pay whether there's English laws or not. You actually brought up something important for your work, which doesn't apply to all people working in this space, which is you've got aspects that could fall under tribal law, you've got aspects that could fall under Canadian law, you've aspects that maybe could fall under American law. I don't know if it matters, but where are your files and services actually hosted? You know, if your servers are in America, then does American law apply? So in the 90s, I was building it in New York State, and then some things happened where I was being threatened, people were trying to steal stuff. So I literally took it offline for a while and stored it somewhere that I won't say and just let it be. But nowadays, we have people that have servers on reservations. But these are all different people all over North America. And we haven't come up with the solution, but we're communicating and figuring it out based on what we have to work with. But as far as laws go, I'm a little bit of a jerk with that because I think from the time I was born, I constantly have people colonizing me, like forcefully colonizing me. You have to ask permission to speak. You have to ask permission to exist, all of that. So I have this personality trait where I push back. I don't need anyone's permission to exist. Here I am and I'm doing the best I can with what I have to work with. So all these English and Canadian laws, frankly, they have nothing to do with anything that I'm doing because... They're not my owners. And they're not the owners of our language, of our culture, any of that. They have no say in this. Only people that have say in this is our Ungwahumwe people. And it sounds like there's getting to be a pretty substantial community, not just of Ungwahumwe people, but of indigenous creatives and developers all across the world. And so is there a sense that you guys are creating your own standards for ethics and for service and for ownership? Yes and no, because creating standards to me, I'm like, even that AI guardian code of ethics, I can't take credit for that because it's based on the way I was raised. You know, it's based on my culture and how I was raised. And all of that comes from my ancestors, my community and the people. It's never just one person. Sometimes it looks like it's solitary and stuff, but it really is never like that. Not in these projects that you see today. 
like my first day of doing this, yes, I mean, I was by myself, didn't tell anybody. It actually connected me back to my community so I could heal and do it properly. Because if you do stuff totally by yourself in isolation and you're disconnected, that's not a healthy way to do anything. And that's where I think that big egos come into play, get disconnected and even start thinking you're going to save people. Like it's very unhealthy. You couldn't have spoken truer words, especially in these weird times of isolation. I know how things work out here, but is your reservation, is that a sovereign nation? Is there a similar thing with the Canadian side of things? It's a good question. Honestly, for me, even the word sovereign is very triggering because everyone talks about it, but what is it to be sovereign? Like, I mean, my whole life is violent, genocidal colonization. So am I sovereign? I mean... I don't know, it's really triggering to me, that question, because to even say that word starts freaking wars around here. I can't even answer that, really. Then maybe I should rephrase, and thanks for bearing with me, because I'm trying to understand. Theoretically, is your reservation supposed to be its own country in that way? Yeah, so I can't speak for my reservation on that sense, but I can speak for my personal views on that. My personal view is based on the language, which is connected to our homelands, is Ungwahunwe people, original human beings. From the north to the south pole, this is our homelands. Obviously, I have some DNA ancestors who are not from these homelands. That's how I see the world, but it doesn't mean that's how the rest of the people see the world, and they treat me accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, personally, all the treaties are I've never seen those treaties be held. What's that to me? It means nothing to me. Yes, we're a reservation, but we also have people that are Catholic, some are Christians, some are Muslims, some are long held, some are traditional. You got people like me who are not quite in any of those. So for me, I can't answer that for my entire reservation. Well, part of why I was asking is because I was really struck when you said how you've got people that may be scattered right now geographically, but they're trying to address the issues, which I think are really critical because whether that server was on the res or whether it was in Canada or whether it was in America could at some point matter. It always matters. It always matters. And I have been threatened with you name it. I've been in the tech industry over 30 years. I've seen a lot of things and like had some clients like aren't really very nice sometimes, you know? They wanna own all of your equipment. Like one year I got so sick, I was dying. When everyone found out, people started calling. They wanted all my equipment. Like give us your equipment. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely always on my mind. And there will always be people that wanna exploit because they're leading their lives and everything by fear. Maybe they're afraid their family will starve or they won't get the new car. That's always going to happen. But we can't let that lead our work. We just can't. Well, Monica, I just want to say this has just been absolutely inspirational speaking with you today. If I can say it right, Nyawe. Thank you so much for your time. And I really am excited about spending more time in some of your virtual worlds. Thank you so much for having me on here. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to talk with you guys. And if you would like more information, you can visit mohawklanguage.ca or monigar.com online. And that's M-O-N-I-G-A-R-R.com. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council, produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.